Well, here we are again. This is day two of the peacock painting with my handmade watercolour pigments. I thought today I'd give you a little talk through as we do the painting just to, to show you and tell you a little bit more about these pigments. Uh, the first one I'm going to introduce you to is this lovely blue. So these are the just the washing up from making the pigment yesterday uh, that I put into little mussel mussel shells. So here you can see this one's not quite dried yet, so you still see the carrier on top. But here you can see that the pigment has dried completely. Cobalt blue was introduced in 1802. It's uh, it's a nasty little pigment actually. When you're making it, you have to use a respirator to make it. But uh, once it's in its carrier, it's gonna do no harm to you. Obviously, all these are genuine pigments, so they're not kiddie safe. They are for professional artists, and I don't want you licking your paintbrushes. That's definitely a no-no. Um, but here is cobalt blue. It's a very bright blue, as you can see. And that's because it's got a very small molecular weight, which means you need a lot of pigment in any given amount of paint. And I did make a video of that being made yesterday, so maybe... I might post that later and you can have a look at it. But it's a lovely blue and uh, gives you this really fantastic, vivid colour. And as you can see with these natural pigment paints, the carrier dries and then you're left with the small grind of pigment on top. Unlike a more modern watercolour paint, a modern watercolour paint often has dyes and fillers in. That's A, to make it cheaper, but equally to, to get as much saturation on the paper whereas with these traditional ones these artist pigments you build them up over a period of time and so you get this this lovely feel the green in it here is a, a lovely green this is a green earth pigment it's from roman times so you if you go to herculaneum or pompeii you'll see this color on the walls they used to apply it with wax or with an egg based carrier paint. Very light fast, all these colours that we're using today are completely light fast, they'll outlive you and me. This one's a nice one, this has got a nice history. This is Venetian red, and as you can see, it's still very liquid, even a day later. And this was used very much so in the Renaissance. So a lot of the flesh tones that you see Grand Masters used, they, they would use Venetian red with a lead white, but here we're using it as a watercolour. And it does give you these beautiful tones. This one that I made, I've actually put in some uh, mica, so it's got a slightly sparkly tone to it. So that's a really lovely paint. The yellow that I'm using is golden ochre, and this is French. So this really does have some history on it. This is from prehistoric times and the cave paintings were uh, were painted with these. So, you know, again, very light fast, 50,000 years you'll get on it. Longer than your uh, painting will last, I'm sure. So we're going to do a little bit of painting. I've busted out my, my finest um, paintbrushes. I've got a zero, zero, a zero and a one. These are all series seven. I really like these. These are smashing. And I just paint with a little bit of paper just by the side here so that I can see what sort of tint strength I have before I start painting. So we'll we'll start with the one. And I'm just going to make sure I've not got too much paint on the brush. And use some of this green earth. And so I'm just layering over. So this this morning I went over this. I had the wash on yesterday that you saw on the film. And then I did a quick coat before I went to see Nia and collect my eggs. And uh, I'm back on it now in the afternoon. It's, it's all dried off. And so it's going for its third coat. You probably don't want more than um, four coats on any watercolour. Because you, you're going to miss the translucent quality of it if you put more than four on. I've tried it and I, and I did a, a painting just recently to see just physically how much pigment paint I could get on. And, and you can you can get about eight, but then you just you just lose the the nature of it really. So I'm gonna shush up while I get on with this. 
you can see I mean this is literally the washing up water from from yesterday's paint making and you can see how much pigments in it so the peacock drawing that I've got here I'm actually going to be selling these so that you too can have your own peacock and you can just paint it it's more like a fancy colouring in book I suppose it's on watercolour paper and you'll be able to render them in any colour you like but obviously you know if you want to buy some of the pigments to do it then I'll be advertising those You can see the shiny nature of the honey at this stage but it goes to a nice sort of satin finish when it's dried so sticking with the green but moving to the triple o brush because i want to put some details onto here the green's not an opaque colour, it's it's a weak tint in strength really. But that's not a bad thing for watercolours. Means it can be more delicate. I'm just popping the detail in now. Whatever watercolour paint you use, but particularly pigment paint, what you're seeing now is not necessarily what you're going to get when it's dried because obviously the carrier affects the strength or the look of the pigment. And then when it dries, it, it changes its its tone. And that's the magic of it, really. Uh, and I think best advice for watercolour painting is just get it on. Don't go mad with it. Just let it dry. Have some patience in between. Oh, that's a police out again. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. I don't know what's going on. Usual sort of thing in ball. That's oh, a fire engine, that doesn't sound so good. So just with the triple zero, or the zero zero, this one is, I think. I'm just putting the fine details in. Look this peacock. I've tattooed loads of peacocks over the years. And this, this design actually that I've drawn is, is based on uh, a back piece from the 1950s. I didn't paint that, I didn't tattoo that, but I was inspired by it. And it's this one's probably spawned lots of tattoos over the years, this classic piece. This is very modern with its how its feathers are done. And the peonies are very popular throughout history really you see a lot of peonies in Japanese art so this is getting all the feathery details in like I say this is coat number three so I'll have another one of of these and on the green I think I've only got one coat so I might put another tone in maybe two tones I don't know see what I'm left with after it's dried
It is really relaxing, his watercolour painting. It's not a, a rush job. It's just something to take your mind off. Life's nonsense, really. So I've got the cobalt blue at the moment in the feathers and, and uh, obviously the centre eye of the peacock feather is, is the, the green earth. But I'm going to put a little bit of green into the feathers now. So again, with the smallest brush, I'm just going to paint it through. And that, that looks quite dramatic at this stage, but it you'll see that there's a... the blue will will actually shine through the green. And it will just give you a hint of it. I did make a mermaid green, if any of you have been following my paint making. And that was using the Roman green earth, but with a mica. This isn't it, this is just a, a standard one. So no shimmer on this. But it's it's great, I mean it's fantastic for landscapes but interestingly the renaissance artists used to use the green earth as a shadow or undertone for flesh for for doing uh, portraits and the like so it's actually quite nice as a an underpainting we might do a a portrait to to show you that at some stage mainly because it has got this very soft pigment strength and I think even here you can see that the modern if you can call 1802 modern cobalt blue looks different to the others and the, the sort of artificial blues were developed because all, all we really had in terms of blue was the lapis paints well first of all they were really expensive I mean the, all blues are expensive in the cobalt blue here but the lapis obviously was a semi-precious jewel and, and very expensive and gave a very weak tinting strength. And there was this re requirement really to find a bright blue, especially for sky and, and the like, and blue robes and what have you. So there was a big push for it. And that's why they came up with these. And that's probably that probably culminated in things like um, a, an artificial lapis, which is really what ultramarine is. The great thing about the natural pigments is that you tend not to have any sort of strange chemical reactions with them because they're natural, whereas the the non-organic pigments, you know, you can like ultramarine itself. You can have problems with that if you mix it with various compounds. Which, of course, you know, artists found out over years and years of practice. So we're really lucky in this day and age that we're, we're sort of standing on the shoulders of giants. Especially the craftsmen of the Renaissance because, you know, they really did push it in terms of making paints and they, they would make all their own paints so you know what we're doing here putting the leftovers in the shells is certainly what the renaissance artists would do they they probably just wouldn't use a gum paste on its own they would uh, definitely use an egg they'd probably mix it with an egg and you can still do watercolors now with a, an egg Gives you a more opaque sort of satin finish in the watercolours. And of course you have to be careful about how long you keep it. Otherwise it'll get a bit smelly. Once it's on the paper it's not too bad because it's quite thin. One of the things that I was uh, reading about recently is how all the Grand Masters would often do an underpainting of the egg paint for their shadows, for their oil paintings. So that modern painters try to do the detail in oils that the Grand Masters did and then find that they, they can't do that because, uh, you know, they're trying to use oil paints which don't allow for the fine detail that an egg paint would. And the egg paint was used extensively 
through Roman and Greek times, so that's, you know, always the best, I don't know. So I'm just working my way through here, just giving little highlights of the green. Nothing too taxing. So I'm cleaning my brush most times just because it's it's now starting to dry in the shells from yesterday. So I actually needed more liquid. So here it is, effectively washing up water, but I'm having to dilute it because the pigment strength is, is so strong. So looking at it, I always miss bits. I don't know if you like that when you paint, but I always miss bits. So I'm just going to go over to the blue, and I'm probably going to use this this dried blue because I, I want to do some sort of darker areas. I don't know if you can see this. So this is just the dried pigment, and so that's just me moistening it. So this is be more much more like the pigment that you buy from me in a in a half pan. And you can see how strong it is. I'll just paint it there. You see how how dark it is so that if you were you know obviously wanting to make a wash you'd, you'd have plenty of pigment to make a wash you wouldn't normally paint it straight out of the pan which is effectively what I'm doing here except I want these darker tones of it so I'm just going to dip my paintbrush and some water now just to make a wash and even even dipped in water look how much pigment is there still yeah I just a little bit about dark there yeah. I just see a little bit something. Oh yeah, that could be darker there. So really, this is tonal. I'm not not using. It's it's a strength of of paint really that I'm using because obviously you've got the black of the drawing. And whether I put a, a latter sort of grey on it or something like that, I might do. I'm probably going to bust out some washers tomorrow and show you how to use use little half pan washers that I put in the sets and they're made up of um, pigment that's that's made with sort of a slacker medium and then it's poured so it's a full half pan when it goes in but it dries just to coat the sides and it just makes it easier for you to make into a, a wash especially on the go so I'll probably show you those tomorrow right now I'm just concentrating on using up me washing up water <laughs> to paint with I know Kev got his set today and I put a few of these shells in he's probably looking at this hopefully watches this and go, oh that's what those shells are for I wonder what she's doing she's gone mad a lot of painting those shells Kev so love these series seven brushes i, I really like a, a bigger version of these i've got all the little ones because even these are quite expensive um, but the big ones are like i don't know under a pound a brush so I, I don't think i'll be having one of those soon <laughs> but um i've got lots of lots of lovely old brushes anyway the important thing with watercolor brushes is to look after them so that once you've finished painting, make sure you, you wash them, clean them, shake out the water. 
Uh, don't ever leave your paint brushes in water. I, I, I got this because this was a little brush stand and I, ne I never use it. Look, can you see that? You know, so you put your brushes like that. I always forget to use it. I'll put it there. It's decoration, I think. Always make sure that you wash out your brushes, give them a shake, and then put them somewhere safe. I, I, they're covered with these normally when you buy a good quality brush. And once it's washed out and shaped, I'll put that back on. And really a watercolour brush, unless you do anything really stupid with it, should last you for the rest of your life really. You know, you've got to do something daft with it. And these are sable brushes. Not the same as acrylic brushes or particularly oil paint brushes who don't doesn't last long but you, you tend to scrub the pigment in to a canvas and they don't last as long at all. But again, you know, quite often you can buy second hand brushes on eBay and uh, all they need is washing. You know, they just need cleaning and washing and they're fine. Just people look at them and go, oh, I've ruined that brush. But, you know, there's ways around that. I might show you that on a video if you're interested to let me know. What you'd like to see, if you'd like to see any of it, I don't know. You might not, not, not be interested, but if you do, I can show you how to maintain a brush. So, let's do it with the blue. Probably see something else once it's dried and I'm, oh yeah, I could do with that. It's a bit more green, I think. Roman green look fantastic we could be in Herculaneum now just before the Pompeii volcano bus could be there doing our painting oh we're running for the hills oh maybe not the hills no <laughs> running for the seaside that fantastic nice nice thought isn't it that you're painting with something that's been used for thousands of years I, I really like I mean I love history anyway but you know, when I make these paints, I think, oh, somebody's done this, you know. Somebody doing exactly what I'm doing thousands of years ago, grinding the paint, making paints. And if you paint with my paints, then you're, you know, you're following that historical footstep. That's really cool. Well, I think it is, anyway. Give me tummy rumbling. I probably need to have my lunch. There we go. I've got to say, this morning when I came to just do the second coat, I think I only came here to clean my glasses. And then I saw it and I thought, oh, God, I have a quick paint. Can't help myself. It's lovely. I don't know, are you are you like that with your painting? Do you see it? Oh, oh God, I'll just do a bit while I'm here. So, I haven't got much green up here yet. So I put this, these blue tones in his, his wing feathers. And when I was painting this, uh, or when I was drawing this peacock, should I say, before I started to paint it, my friend Sue Bottomley has a peacock visitor in the garden and she calls him Bluey. And he's a magnificent creature. He's, imagine having a wild peacock come and visit you. In your garden that's pretty cool isn't it i suppose he must have been a pet at some stage and he's gone rogue i quite like that a rogue peacock but, um, he comes and adorns her garden well, i think he'd fit in my garden well if he did i think my main coon cats would have something to say to him it wouldn't end well, but I don't know for. They're quite big creatures, aren't the peacocks? So I'm just giving it an overpainting. I know I can be, you know, I, I don't have to be too um, careful with my colour strength here because it's this, this green. I'll probably lose some black because it is an earth colour, so it'll matte off. 
if you like, and, and it will hide the blackness. But I'll probably go around at the end and I'll show you using Indian ink and I'll show you using um, just an ordinary pen to put in details. Indian ink I like better because it's shiny and it gives you a nice shiny finish. It's obviously very black, it goes over anything. Um, but I'll show you the difference of, of using, obviously, if you're using a fine pen, then it's easier because it's more controlled. And it can be a problem, you know, if you're going to put pen on top of uh, a lovely watercolour like this to do a, 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 a beautiful pen and watercolour finish, quite often, you you know, the idea is you do your pen first, put your watercolours on top. But in all fairness, you do need maybe to strengthen up the black. <laughs> and uh, you can do all of this and you can have hours of work in it and then go splodge with the ink and it's ruined. But, you know, hey ho, that's that's how it is. We, we might do some experimental bits and pieces with this as a background because I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do as a background. But I, when I did the Boss Seascape just recently, I had a little corner of, of starlight and infinity, as I call it. Um, I don't know whether this wants that or not. I might I might do a little touch of that somewhere in a corner uh, and show you how that's done. Mainly because I'm I'm playing with it. So that if you if you do go and buy this drawing from me to paint it yourself you know you really can render it in any way you want you could use color pencils you could use watercolors obviously it's on watercolor paper so it's really meant for that but there's plenty of background here to, to add your own touches and to make it yours so every, everyone would be different so just looking for areas I'm trying to get there with the green but I've got the wrong Wrong size paintbrush, really, for that. So I'm going to look at that in a minute. Because I'm never patient enough to do the fine details. I'm just down here. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. You hear the cars going past, can you? The cars going past. Really busy in both. Everybody's come on their holidays. I suppose I can't go to Spain, so they've come to both. The beach is busy. Nobody's wearing a mask. Because I suppose I feel safe. I hope they are safe, but you know, I, I wear a mask when I go out. So I went out this morning to collect eggs from my friend Nia, who runs the little garden centre up the road. And has some lovely chickens, just lovely eggs. And uh, I'm probably going to do a film making some egg tempura paint at some stage, or tempera paint, tempura, I'll say that. That's that's, a, that's what Chinese put on their batter, isn't it? Tempera paint. Um, but you have to have it on eggs that are laid that day. It has to be fresh, apparently. Because uh, otherwise it's smelly. And I've always done it with... Eggs that are laid that day because I don't want to risk it. <laughs> I don't know if we do it with a whether it makes a difference or not. I don't know. I expect it does, but um, so we might do that at some stage. Probably if I uh, I've got an oil painting that I'm quite interested in doing. Um, but there's several. I, I've got quite an extensive sketchbook this summer because obviously I'm going to university in September to do fine art and. Um, I'm going to be a 55 year old art student. Oh, well, somebody's got to do it. And I'm really excited about it. And so I've, I've been keeping a sketchbook. I, to be fair, I've been doing more painting, more drawing out of the sketchbook than I've probably been doing in it. But it's, it's led me to have ideas I want to paint. So I'm not sure what all painting I'm going to do yet. I've, I've got. I've got an abstracted mind as well, and, and I'm not an abstract painter, but I've got this, I had a dream, so I've got my sketchbook, so I might do that at some stage. Um, but I'm going to do an underpainting, just to show you really, because obviously I can, I can make the egg tempera 
paints to show you how it's done. So I'm quite looking forward to that. Though I ordered some canvas boards just recently and unfortunately when you order anything off the internet you know some you, sometimes you look in it comes nice and I suppose boards are probably quite difficult to post but it's it's damaged at the sides at the corners so I need to replace those I guess um, or you know if they don't replace them then I might I might just use them as, as a some practice boards I guess so they're not wasted so just the the stem here of the peacock feather I'm colouring in with this Roman green like I say it because it's an earth pigment it, it, it does have a matte surface so some of this I'm definitely gonna go over with some Indian ink at some stage just to darken it all up right at the end This is getting my tones in. Let's get that on there. Right, I'm going to change brushes now. So, I don't know if I can do this on camera. No, I can't really without showing you. But literally, to shape up a really good sable brush like this, I've washed it. In theory, you're supposed to wash it on the tap, and I will do when I've, when I've actually finished the day. And just run it through on the tap. But what you do to, to clean it is you just literally flick it. So I'm not going to do that because I'm going to go over my me, me paint. But I'll do it to the side here. And you just flick the water and it shapes it up nicely. So that's it. And it really you should, should put it on the side somewhere so it's flat to dry. But it's just going to go here. So looking at this one, I'm going to pick up... Um, this is my number one brush. Which, when I first started this painting, I used, I think I used a five and a one. So the five I just went over loosely and then put some of the details in the one. And, and it was the one that I used this morning to to do the second sort of underpainting. But I didn't put any green on, on his neck there. So again, because I want a broader stroke. And um, I want it fairly moist, so... So I want a sort of thin coating. You'll see when I do it. Can you see that? I think you can. So obviously putting the bright blue underneath the Roman green gives me a better sort of shimmer than if I'd have put the green on first and put the bright blue on top. Because if I put the bright blue on top, it would have overpowered the green. The 2,000 year old colour competing with the 200 year old colour. So you don't really want that. And you can see on some of this, like I've gone over here, but I, you know, I'm going to put a background on, so I'm not, I'm not too worried, really. So again here, I'll just probably just run a little bit more green. I don't want to, I don't want it to be too overbearing I sort of want hints of a tint if you like so I think that's it for that one give that a shake and then um, this one is a zero so the middle size of the three that I've picked now and I'm going to do some detailing on the the red peonies the Venetian red peonies Venetian red's really interesting because you can make a dye out of this stuff as well and in fact um, the dye they're made out of this Venetian red pigment and it's a ferric oxide that lives in, in the earth so it's, you know, they dig it out uh, and when they make a dye of it it goes a slightly deeper red because obviously they put various bits and pieces with it and this red as a dye is what they dyed the red coats in for the new model army of Cromwell and then that continued and one of the reasons um, they did that. There's a good story that um, there was an army that had to have some sort of uniform, and they were all peasants in those those days, I guess. So they didn't have a uniform. Anyway, somebody knocked them up a uniform, but it was in virgin white wool, and in the end, it ended up being a, a stand, and they um, 
were slaughtered. Lambs to the slaughter, that's where that phrase comes, phrase comes from. And of course these virgin lamb wool jackets were turned red. Uh, and so after that, they, the new model army dyed their, their coats, their uniforms red with Venetian red, but as a dye. So it's, you know, I, I'm sure as you've seen the red coat uniforms in the museums and now I suppose at the Changing Guard Buckingham Palace, it's a deeper red, but originally it was Venetian red. And then the British Army continued it after, after Cromwell went. So it's got a long old history of this stuff. Here it is, it's on a lovely peony now. So I'm just putting some detail. So this is with the zero and you can see, cause this is, this is my Venetian red and it's got a little bit of mica in it. So it's got sparkles. So it's got a bit of modern as well as all that history. You can't really see it until it's, you probably got to see it close up. I took a picture of it this morning put the flash on to try and get the sparkle what's the point you know oh what do you need to put a sparkling paint for you don't it's just because I can and it's sort of nice and it makes it different I don't put it on everything I just fancy putting some Venetian red with a little bit of mica in it and it's got a bit of cat hair in it there as well I think that's come laterally hopefully your paints won't come with with cat hair but if they do it's main cone cat hair that's important. One of my main cones likes to paint. If he can get in here, he'll run off with the brushes. Kilimanjaro will run off with the brushes. He likes to garden as well and eat strawberries. So, there it is. Let's come out. There we go. So I don't know if he's snuck in here. He's not allowed in here because he runs off with my brushes. And he has been known to walk through paints and then put painty paw prints on everything, which is obviously if you worked really hard at something, it's annoying. So I, I try and remember to to actually um, close the door properly so you can't get in. And that's that's what my husband says. You didn't close the door properly. It's your fault. When we went up to Nia's today, you can see how this is a, a third coat and see how strong. This this Venetian red is now. It's not the thin red line anymore, is it? There it is. It's look, it's coming. And um, anyway, he was Kilimanjaro was slept on on Eddie's bed, and he said, oh, "I can't leave him in there with all my computers." So he, he, I said, "Oh, I'll leave him. He'll be fine. He's asleep. He's not going to hurt anything." And then just as we were going out, he decided to climb on Eddie's computer desk. So very quickly, we got <laughs> we got him out. So I think he knows. Maybe he just likes to be interactive, I don't know. So I'm just reinforcing the shapes of these peonies. And it, it's the same same paint, but it's layering up. So it's, it's that layer of the same colour. But you can put a different colour on your peonies on top of another colour if it's translucent. So modern pigments tend not to be very translucent and that's the great thing about these traditional ones because it's little bits of pigment dispersed into the carrier by its very nature it's not necessarily opaque though if you kept layering it up this they would be with the green as you can see It's thickening up because that's an earth pigment. It'd be nice to show you when this is dry, some of the areas. I don't know if I can, I mean, this is my phone I'm using to film with. So if I had Eddie's fancy filming kit, maybe I could show you the detail, but I can't. So let's say, Eddie, come take a picture of this. I don't know, did you like the advert that Eddie made for me? for the paints. It was really clever. It took him days, you know, and there was things on wires and he was spinning the palette and and uh, it was beautiful what he did. It was really great. Um, obviously Facebook liked it and said, oh, you know, do you want to have an advert? 
but as I've only got two pallets to sell and I've sold one to Kev already, I'm not making very much on it, so I, otherwise I, I would have put an advert, paid for it, but that would have, well, it'd be more than my profit, so. You can help spread the word about my paint making by sharing, sharing videos and sharing pictures. And buying it, and buy some pigment. Take up watercolour painting. Like I say, I'm going to do some drawings that are printed out on watercolour paper for you to have a go at painting. So even if you say, well, look, I can't draw D, it's no point in me doing this. At least you can give it a go because I've done all the, the art bit and you, you just have to colour it in effectively. Uh, and you can have fun with that. And it will be a nice piece, whatever, whatever colours you decide to do. And it will be yours your bit of art with a little bit of help from me you have something nice to put in the frame and you put it up on your walls and enjoy it so there's a peonies coming together i think they're looking more peony like i really love this color i think it's just you know and i, I love herculaneum i love pompeii and I've seen this colour painted on the walls. A red earth colour, like I said, very popular. Also in Renaissance times as a, an oil paint to do flesh tones. And you can, you can see that, you can see how that will be the case. It's a beautiful colour. I made some oil paint the other day because I thought I would. Though traditionally, if you're making pigment oil paints yourself, you make them the day you paint. So you decide what colours you're going to use that day and you make them. It's interesting because the Japanese do that with tattoo ink. Not not necessarily nowadays, but the Tabori artists did. Uh, and the, the Tabori artists say that the ink is alive, so you make it at the time. Um, why the why the traditional painters did that is because they didn't really keep. So the oil paint that you have in the tube will go hard quite quickly without the modern fillers or some of the colours will, particularly earth ones. And I made some burnt umber, but I had a, you know, a full uh, pot of, of pigment and they made sort of like half a tube because burnt umber takes a lot of oil. So, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. I might, I might bust that out if I do this whole painting, show you me burnt umber, but um, I'll definitely be making it on the day, I think. And oil paint takes so, up so much pigment, it's, it's incredible really, it absorbs the oil, where it just floats in, in the gum arabic and honey. I don't think I'll be selling oil paints. I don't think I, well first of all to process the amount of colour that you need I don't particularly want to do it so you know if you like I'm operating a cottage cottage industry here I don't know why I decided to make the, the watercolours and, and sell them I suppose it's during lockdown and I was just I was just fed up with bought watercolours even the even the really good ones I was thinking oh you know I can make a better one than this and I did a pigment course years ago with um, a very famous shop that supplies the Queen with pigments in London and um, I thought oh I'll put that knowledge to, to use and also obviously in the past we've made tattoo pigments not, not nowadays we don't um, Though sometimes I think maybe we should. I think, again, you probably, at least you know what goes in them. But you've got all sorts of health and safety issues if you make tattoo pigments now. So I think it's probably not something for me. But I, I, I buy and made ones from a UK manufacturer now instead. But he's got machines to do it. I mean, it's a, it's a horribly messy job. Whereas if I'm making watercolour paints, I can make small batches. And I quite like that. 
and I'm hoping that people will like it when they buy it because you know that colour is not going to be the same as the next colour but it doesn't matter because you're using it in your painting you know the idea is that it's unique it's it's something special and well, I think that's that's cool we've been like the traditional artists of old so how's that looking oh, looking nice put a bit more here don't know if you can see the sparkle on the film probably not put a few dots on my penis i don't know if penis have dots but mine are gonna have dots so it's my blooming painting Probably lilies have dots, but my pin, my pin, it's my painting. I've got dots on me. I just like it. So. Put dots in a lot of my tattoos as well. If anybody's got any of my tattoos, oh yeah, I've got some of these dots. Pointillism, I guess. Visual dissonance. Dissonance? Oh, I don't know how you say that. Anyway, breaks up the line, doesn't it? And these will, they won't dry like dots, they'll just like, I don't know, makes it more natural perhaps. I don't know, I like it. So, yeah, by painting. And you can do what you like, whatever you like. I don't know what colours you like, what's your favourite colour, how you like to paint. You're in charge, aren't you? When it comes to your little world of art I think that's why I like coming down here and especially you know during Covid I've just been a pain in the bum because I've not been able to tattoo and that's dreadful for me and it's just nice to come and escape and have a little bit of art hopefully I'll be back tattooing soon I'm waiting for a, a battery respirator I'm, I call it my Darth Vader mask could use it for making the cobalt blue as well. That'd be handy. Opposed to trying to breathe through a, a big respirator mask, which is horrible. I certainly wouldn't want to tattoo with that on, because especially in the heat at the moment. So I'm hoping the battery respirator, when it comes, will enable me to tattoo safely and fairly comfortably, because I do long sessions on people. And obviously I wear glasses, so. Right. Now I'm going to give that little shake back to my finest brush. A bit more detail in, in the eyes here on the feathers, peacock feathers. So there we go. really interesting because when I tattoo I put lots of detail in and especially if I'm doing detailed back pieces some of you got my back pieces and you never see it which I hope you have pictures taken of your back pieces so you can see the detail because there's so much detail in them I like detail so Guess you get to study it. You can see here the pigment's starting to dry now. And look how, how it's softened up as it's dried. Try not to put my paws on. what I've already painted so right I'm now going to use some of this as a shadow it sounds a bit odd but you'll you'll understand again we're layering it up so it, it's dried the cobalt actually dries really quickly because of its its makeup and um, oh look I've missed a bit of cobalt there typical I'll do that in a minute but I'm going to show you what it's like to layer it on top. If you mix blue and red together, you, you get purple. Now, obviously, they're 
it's not a, a pure sort of dark blue it's not a pure red so what sort of purple are you going to get you're going to get sort of like a maroony purple i think is the best way to describe it but again it's it's different because we've got some green there as well um and we've got a bright blue and then an earth pigment going on top so i want to show you and again so this this is a be the fourth layer on this one so not much more but look it gives you a nice it gives you a nice shadow or, or detail that you can put in so if you like it's like mixing on the paper but you're doing it in layers and again the old masters, the grandmaster painters, Leonardo da Vinci, the Renaissance, they all used layering. Titian, Titian used up to 40 layers. Something that I think this quote is that it, when the restorers found it, they had like 50 layers. You know, can you imagine that many layers on an oil painting? And he did it not by mixing purple on a palette, but by mixing the coloured layers and what does this give you? It gives you a certain subtlety to the colour. It makes it less flat. It makes it more lively. I suppose, you know, a blind man on a galloping horse wouldn't see the difference. But, you know, this is, again, for you to enjoy. So you can study your, your painting at a later date. Go, oh yeah, look, I'm like Titian. I'm putting on my layers. <laughs> I'm putting on my layers on. Layers. And and again, you know, if you've had a tattoo by me, I do the colouring layers. And it, and it does on a tattoo it makes a difference because your body heals it at different levels. Or different skin levels, so it really does make the colour. So they are, look, you know, tattooing and the old masters of painting. Oh, look, there's a bit of something there. There's a bit of cobalt blue on it. I, I picked four colours for this painting. I, what I do in the background, I don't know yet. I, I made this slate grey. I might do a slate grey background, but... Like I say, I might do this infinity background. I haven't decided yet. You want to know what an infinity background is? It's with the stars and the universe. It's, it's a bit popular at the moment, I think, especially in illustrations. But by having a limited colour palette in a painting, it gives you sort of a harmony to it. Whereas if you have 101 different colours, it, it can be a bit jarring. I mean, sometimes that's good, you know. I mean, sometimes you want a, a jarring look to things, but sometimes you don't. And, um, oh, shall we, this is bluey. Shall we say that this is Sue's bluey? I don't know, does, does it look like this? Probably not. This one's a very glamorous one, isn't it? It's definitely different gear. I'm going to put a little bit of red in his eyes here and I'm going to overpaint it with the golden ochre. And put a little bit on the painting there on his on his mush. Probably keep knocking my the camera with my head. We've been painting, it's just coming up to an hour now. So if you're still watching this on oh, Blumen Egg, I've done well. And I'm still learning the the social media posting things. God dear, it's all right, carry on in there. What the post, what the won't post. Oh, to be 19 and understand it all. I certainly don't. So, 
I'll do my best. I might have to make a YouTube channel or something. Then nobody will see it, but I don't know. So you can see there, mixed with the, the blue, the green, and the red, it goes a brown colour. But here, it's got more sort of a maroony colour. Which is, is quite nice. I'll just keep some of the blue. Get there, don't they? Gonna stop in a minute. I think. Well, I might, I might put some yellow on. I haven't done. I've only done one coat of yellow, so I, might, I should put some yellow on. I'm feeling quite hungry, and I've got rumbly tummy. I might have a cheese sandwich and go and sit outside and look at everybody on the beach. Getting hot and sweaty. I quite fancy going swimming, but it's a bit busy at the moment. Nice, isn't it? Oh, I go swimming. No, I don't see much in the way of jellyfish at the moment, so it's probably a good time to go swimming. Right, so anyway, I'm going to come. Still using uh, uh, this tiny brush, I'm going to go to the golden ochre. Lovely, lovely colour, this, isn't it? I don't know if you can see it. Beautiful colour, and you can see that this has dried quite quickly. So this, like I say, being used. 50,000 years plus on the cave paintings in France. I mean, that's cool, isn't it? I'm a caveman. There we go. There you go. Not painting woolly mammoths, painting peacocks. So this is an opaque colour, so whatever you put on, I mean if it's very weak it won't be, because just by definition it won't be. So obviously if you're spreading the carrier about, then once the carrier is evaporated and dried off, you're just going to be left with the pigment particles. But got more covering power with this than say you have other things so there we are putting a bit of detail in See well where the red oak glaze went over this and gave me sort of like little orange tones in this, but that's quite nice. I think in watercolor, it, it's not it, it's not like coloring inside the lines. You know, you let it flow really, and then you get the you get the best sort of use or flow of the of the medium that you're using. And you can see I put mica in this one as well, so look, you can you can see it's got like a little golden sparkle. I don't know if you can see that, but it has. Um, it just makes it more golden, I guess. And so if the if the mica ends up at the bottom of a an ochre pigment molecule, you won't see the sparkle, but if it's on top, you will, because it's not translucent. But uh, like I said, you know, just enjoy making these pigments and, and I thought, oh, golden ochre, I'll have a bit of golden mica as well. So there we go. You can see, I don't know if you can see on that yellow there, it, it's, and it'll dry fairly opaque. So there's, there's actually details on the centre of these peonies. Um, 
which in a measure will be eaten by this, depending on how it dries. What my brush has put on there, but probably knocking the thing. Can you see that there? I think you probably can. There we go. So at the moment I haven't, this is watercolour paper, but I haven't stretched it. It's not, I think it's a, it's about 200 GSM, it's not a 300 one, which you probably don't need to stretch. So you have to be careful with it. But again, because we're using pigments, it you, the paper doesn't necessarily get so wet. We're going to do a wash, especially if we do the infinity thing. Um, then I'll probably put it on a board but I'll probably just put it down with a, a low tack. I won't stretch it as such, but I'll hold it flat. Um, in any case, what you can do is once it's all dry, just put it in a book to flatten it out again. But it's, it's not the same as, as modern pigments you know, modern watercolour paints you tend to get, you know, really you have to work up a lather to get any sort of colour out of them. Um, that's not what this is like. The colour is there and it's not going anywhere, it's a pigment. Can't escape it. So. I'll put a little bit of gold in these. Of course I can. I'm just putting a little bit of, just a bit of gold in these Venetian red peonies, just as little highlights almost. I've been um, putting blue on these, but some like here, because there's, there's blue next to it on these, I suppose there's stamens or twiddly bits. Then I'm probably going to stick to the yellow here. Again, it's my painting, so I'll change colour stamens a little just because you can see it more, I think. Go look. You see that? I don't know. I don't know how much it's picking up here. This is all a bit of an experiment for me, filming. Um, Nassim says she likes watching make, me making my uh, pigment paints. She says she finds it very relaxing, so I don't know if she'll find this relaxing. And again, if you do, let me know. I'm, I'm just putting a little bit of gold ochre in to my peacock feathers. It because it's got a blue undertone anyway. It'll have it'll go like a lime greeny. And it's got a bit of red here from when the wash has spilt over. It's quite nice, isn't it? You can see how it's coming along. A treat. So I'm looking at an hour and three minutes. I've had a bit waffle during that time, but I've been painting quite a long time. There we go. I've got, um, I might put some, I'm gonna forget that bit there if I'm not careful. I'm, I'm notorious, I'm like that with tattoos as well. You know, forget, oh God, I might put that there. So. Alice says, I never finish a tattoo because I always look at it. Oh, I should have put that on there. I don't know. Is it like paintings? Paintings are never finished. It's really interesting because I, you know, I looked at the the peacock. I mean, this is when I say it's based on a nineteen fifties back piece. Um, she she was wearing a peacock. Nothing like this. It was very heavy, very black, and and there wasn't the detail in things, and certainly there wasn't much going on here. So I actually looked to a reference photograph for this, 
and it's got I don't know the on this they said they've got sort of like a sheen but I'm I'm gonna put a little bit of the golden ochre there. Especially if I do the I, I might do this infinity and, and if I don't do that then it's gonna get lost a bit so I've got to be careful how we're gonna paint that at a later date. Right, while I remember I'm going to just do that bit there which is which I've missed. So I've shaken out my my little paintbrush. Gone into this dry look, it's completely dry now, isn't it? You can see the wicked cobalt blue. 1802. There he is. So where is it? There it is. Look, can you see that bit I've missed? So he's 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 at the back. So I'm gonna put him in quite dark. Um put him in there, put him in there, look. It'll be quite dark there. Right, just well, I've got a little bit of dark on here. Just, so I can't help myself. Oh, can you hear me to me rumbling? Must be time for lunch. I don't know what time it is. I, I don't. It's not lunch time, but I, I don't know if I'm. If you're the same, if you're on lockdown, still, or you're you're working from home, or whatever it is you're doing. Have you lost all time? Oh, it's a nightmare. I hope my um, respirator comes soon because I'll, I'll I'll go do lolly before I get to university. I'll be completely without any time frame at all. Doesn't help that I was up late watching all the lovely thunderstorms last night. That was amazing. Maybe you should have a thunderstorm in the background. I don't know. Right, I'm going to stop there because otherwise I'll be faffing with it. So I'm going to let it dry. I'll probably come back to it tomorrow. I think now, because um, otherwise, I think if you if you keep on at painting, then you you just overdo it. It's better just to go away from it. You've created. You've given you your all for that time. Then just just come away from it and and have a think about it and go back to it the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year. It doesn't matter, but just give it some time. Hope you've enjoyed seeing the peacock being painted with these lovely natural pigments and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.